Is the church the new Israel? This is a crucial question concerning the whole topic of Israel and the church. It massively affects how one interprets many prophecies recorded in scripture. Replacement theology teaches the church has replaced Israel in God's plans, prophecies, blessings, and as the people of God. Some even add that Israel has been repudiated by God. Some preachers and pastors use the term new Israel or spiritual Israel for the church, but nowhere are these terms found in the scriptures. A variation of this idea is that true Israel has always been the church. Replacement theology is sometimes called supersessionism, from the verb supersede, which means to take the place of or to supplant. Those who hold this view, they dislike the term replacement theology and use terms such as fulfilment theology or inclusion theology. A problem for those who call the church New Israel or spiritual Israel is that many of the Bible references to Israel or Israelite or Zion are not good. And those who hold to replacement theology do not usually wish to apply these particular scriptures to the church. So this leaves it up to subjective personal choice of the interpreter as to which scriptures to apply and which not. To say the least, this is highly problematic. However, inevitably, in replacement theology, the church tends to inherit the many positive promises and blessings given to Israel, but not any of the curses. One of the earliest recorded examples of replacement theology was that of the influential philosopher and Christian apologist Justin Martyr, who uh, wrote the following approximately 155 AD. The Jews have forfeited the scriptures and the prophets are now the property of the church. He wrote, Christ is the Israel and the Jacob. Even so we, and he's talking about Christians, who have been quarried out of the bowels of Christ are the true Israelitic race. Oregon in the third century was also one of many promoting supersessionism. In the early fifth century, Augustine of Hippo, thought by many to be the most important theologian of all church history, strongly articulated replacement theology, whilst casting insults on the Jewish people. The Christian people, he said, are Israel. And he added, but that multitude of Jews which was deservedly reprobated for its perfidy, for the pleasures of the flesh sold their birthright so that they belonged not to Jacob, but to Esau. Considering that the Lord renamed Jacob Israel, that is an extraordinarily um, worrying statement. In verse after verse in the New Testament, where the word Israel is used, it is never a synonym for the church. Rather than read dozens of verses here, let me just give you two examples from Paul's letter to the Romans, where Israel simply cannot mean the church. Romans 10.1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that I may be saved. Romans 11.25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. If we replace Israel with the church or Israelite with Christian, like many other scriptures, these verses become nonsensical. The late Derek Prince, renowned international Bible teacher and former Cambridge University fellow, wrote the following. I have discovered 77 times instances in the New Testament where the word Israel or Israelite occur. After examining them all, I conclude that the apostles never used Israel as a synonym for the church, nor does the phrase new Israel occur anywhere in the New Testament. I totally agree. But nevertheless, replacement theology teachers still reference a few passages to claim that the church has taken Israel's place in God's purposes. One is Romans 2, 28 to 29, which reads as following. For he's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew who's one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. This praise is not from men, but from God. So they're saying that here the reference is to Christians, um, those who are Jews inwardly. But 
Paul here is not extending the application of the word Jew. He's actually restricting it further to identify those Jews in right standing before God by being born again. The same principle of singling out Jews of faith in their Messiah, Yeshua, the faithful remnant, also applies when Paul says in Romans 9, 6, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. This is probably now the next verse, uh, the most common passage of scripture used to equate Israel with the church. You'll see it on the screen, Galatians 6, 15 to 16, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. But Paul here is referencing two groups. He's not saying the church is the Israel of God. The first were those without a background of Judaism, which included physical circumcision, walking to the new creation, new creatures in Christ. The second group referenced are the Israel of God, those who were a minority of Jews at the time, the faithful remnant who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah and were thus also part of the new covenant. Okay, so is it really a problem calling the church the new or spiritual Israel? Well, let me give you five reasons why I think it is. First, it ignores the fact that God still has a purpose for ethnic Israel and his ancient people, the Jews. His covenantal purposes and promises for them still matter. As Paul wrote concerning Israel, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, Romans eleven twenty nine. The erroneous view that God has cast off Israel has led many in history to some appalling examples of church anti-Semitism. Specific details on this can be found in part five of my Israel and the Church series on the website. To those who think God has finished with this ethnic Israel, Paul wrote Romans 11.1, 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Secondly, viewing the church as new or spiritual Israel inevitably leads to spiritualizing or allegorizing some passages of scripture and divesting them of their straightforward meaning. This is true, for instance, of denying the land promise part of the Abrahamic covenant recorded in chapters Genesis 15 and 17 that promise inheritance of the land of Canaan to Israel. How much this is emphasised in Psalm 105, verses 8 to 11, where it's called an, un where it's an unconditional promise. The words used are God's covenant forever. This is about the land, commanded for a thousand generations, an everlasting covenant, the allotment of Israel's inheritance. God really driving it home that this is a covenant to be fulfilled. Third, replacement theology also leads to misunderstanding and vagueness concerning events of the day of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus and the events leading up to it. As so many of the prophets, prophetic scriptures reference Israel and Jerusalem. Zechariah 14 describes the Lord gathering all nations to battle against Jerusalem, with the Lord himself defeating the attacking forces and his feet eventually standing on the Mount of Olives in triumph as he rescues his ancient covenant people. As the Lord takes his place as king of, the, of, the, of all the earth, and as his kingdom reign is established, those survivors of the nations who came against Jerusalem are then required to go up year on year to worship the Lord as king and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Nations that refuse to do this will be punished with drought. Describing the church as the new Israel leads to confusion in understanding such prophetic passages where Jesus rules from Jerusalem the city he called in the Gospel of Matthew 5.35, the city of the great king. Fourthly, calling the church the new Israel can lead to dangerous Gentile arrogance that Paul warns about in Romans 11, where he describes Gentile believers as a wild olive tree graft into the Jewish olive tree. He warns Gentile believers not to boast against the unbelieving Jewish branches that were broken off, pointedly reminding Gentile Christians, you do not support the root, the root supports you, Romans 11, 18. Finally, replacement theology can lead to an ungodly ungratefulness to the Jews amongst Gentile Christians through failure to acknowledge great indebtedness to them that we Gentile Christians owe concerning the roots of our faith. 
Paul said this of his countrymen in Romans 9, 4 to 5. His countrymen, the Israelites, he said, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen.